Good morning and welcome to First Memorial. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Please join me in the opening and call to worship printed in your bulletins. The heavens declare the righteousness of God. The earth declares God's beauty. From the rising of the sun to its setting, God's word shines forth in glory. Let us receive it at the heart of our worship. Do I have something different? Yes? Good morning. In accordance with the Book of Order of the PCUSA, together with the bylaws of the First Presbyterian Church and Congregation of Dover, the annual congregational meeting will be held on Sunday, August 7th, 2022, in the sanctuary following worship. The purpose of the meeting is to consider two recommendations to amend the bylaws the number of active members needed to constitute a quorum, and the number of elders elected to serve on the session each year. I have the wrong one. Receive the annual reports from all boards, committees, and officers. Elect the auditors and nominating committee. Receive the 2022 church budget. Discuss any financial questions that may be brought up act on any business brought up in compliance with the Book of Order of the PC USA. All church members requested to attend this important meeting. Please note we need a minimum of 25 active members to have the needed quorum. Attest this on the 24th day of July, 2022, Jeanette Felch, Clerk of Session. Okay, shall we try that again? <laughs> now let's do our call to worship. You can find that printed in your bulletins. The heavens declare the righteousness of God. The earth declares God's beauty. From the rising of the sun to its setting, God's word shines forth in glory. Let us receive it at the heart of our worship. Our opening song is Sanctuary. We'll sing it through three times. And I encourage you to allow it to become a prayer as it becomes more familiar.
My brothers and sisters, remember that God loves us. Therefore, by the mercy of God, let us cease to do evil and learn to do good. Let us pray together. Holy God, you call us to do good, seek justice, and care for those in need. Yet how often we place our own comforts above compassion for others. Forgive us, we pray, and cleanse us from these and all our offenses. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Remember, God is merciful and kind. Though our sins be like scarlet, they become like snow. So be at peace, for your sins are washed clean by the goodness of God. In the Beatitudes, Jesus reminded us that blessed are the peacemakers, and he is still calling us to be peacemakers, for our world needs gestures of Christ's peace as much or more than ever. Passing the peace, as we're about to do, is rooted in the Hebrew word shalom, which refers to peace with God as well as the peace of God. So as Jesus said shalom when he met with his friends, I say to you, the peace of Christ be with you. Please share a warm greeting and a sincere sign of God's peace with those here without leaving your seat and with someone, with anyone you call or meet this week. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning, kids. How are you today? Good? Yeah? All right, have you guys ever looked forward to something? Like maybe school starting again? Have you ever looked forward to that? <laughs> to what? Playing, so oh, playing soccer, there you go. Summer vacation, what about Christmas? Do you look forward to Christmas? Morgan gets to look forward to Christmas and then like three days later, your birthday, right? It's pretty awesome. So, now if you think about it today, and you're looking forward to Christmas, it seems like it takes forever, right? Yeah. So what are some things that we do to help us so that maybe we can count down to the days where it's your birthday or Christmas or something? Do you, I know at our house, we have a calendar that's on the refrigerator and we put special things on the calendar and then that helps us kind of count down to when it's going to happen. So, like right now we have school starting on the calendar and I don't think Austin's really looking forward to that one, but it's on there. Mommy, <laughs> Mommy and Daddy are, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in today's scripture lesson we're going to hear about Abraham and he was promised land by God, but he didn't know where exactly to go and they lived in tents while they waited to see where to go and they stayed for a long time and you know what they didn't have a calendar to count down the days so they just waited and waited and waited until they got this promised land so 
What do you think that Abraham had that kept him going? He didn't have a calendar, but he had something that kept him going and kept him waiting. You know? He had faith. He had faith in God that this was going to happen someday. So, today, after church, if we get a couple more people here, we're going to have a congregational meeting, right? Have you guys ever sat through a congregational meeting before? No. So, what it is, is we start looking forward to the future. We elect people to be on our boards and everything. And we have faith in God that he's going to take us through. Just like Abraham, we have faith. Okay? So, let's pray. Dear Lord, today we look to you like Abraham, and we're excited for the future and what you have in store for us. We don't have a calendar or a set date, but we know that your will will come because of our faith in you. Amen. Today's lesson is taken from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, and 8 through 16. For maximum understanding, please follow along in your own Bible, or in the translation in your bulletin which follows. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power of procreation. Even though he was too old and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one person, as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed they were strangers and foreigners on the, on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As good as they always are, Megan's children's messages, 
today's was so good, I'm happy to entertain a motion that you receive that as the sermon instead of what I have prepared. Do I have a second? Megan's father was the first one with his hand in the air. He has made a second. All those in favor say, shut up, Alan. Oh, thanks. You have to be the loudest one in the room? <laughs> Guess we know who your mother is. <laughs> Actually, I wish we could do that. I'm going to try and be quick. Of course, you don't know this. I try to be quick every Sunday. So you see how successful I have been at my life's calling. Looking forward is our title for today. We're looking at 11.10, Hebrews 11.10. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Our lesson for today opens with a profoundly important explanation or definition of what faith is. Worthy subject for any Sunday morning. The author of the letter to the Hebrews writes memorably when he says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I thought you said you were going to turn the fans up so they made more noise and people didn't have to listen to me. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. If you haven't memorized any scripture verses lately and you don't have this one inscribed in your heart, this should be your homework assignment for the week. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Please say that with me. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen or in some translations not yet seen. Do you think you can do that all together in one breath since it's not written down for you to read? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. You're going to be saying that out loud in this room for the next month or so. So I really want you to own this verse. It's at the very heart of what we do and hopefully of who we are. Assurance and conviction giving one confidence in the certainty that God has sent his son to be your Lord and Savior. And having sent his son to be our Lord and Savior, we react typically in one of two ways. We react as scientists with looking for truth with proof. You know, it's like everybody's from Missouri. Show me. Anybody here from Missouri? Truth with proof is not faith. There's nothing to believe. But the vast majority of us who claim faith choose to believe God's words with certainty. Choose to believe that God's words are trustworthy. Choose to believe that God wouldn't lie to us. Choose to believe that something that cannot be seen or held or touched can be described with the word faith. You all turn your TV sets on with a little thing you hold in your hand or if you've got it figured to your smartphone or your watch or something. You don't know how it works, you just know that it works. 
And if it doesn't, it's time to check the batteries. Or, in my case, being a grown-up with great resolve and self-discipline, throw it against the wall as hard as you can until it breaks into a million pieces. That'll show it. Darn remote controls. Plus, I have five of them that sit on my left armrest in my recliner. And they're always sliding off. Plus, I, they feel different, fortunately, cause I, so I can touch them real fast and make sure I pick up the right one. The DVD player has a rounded bottom, and I can picture that very quickly with the tips of my fingers. The TV set itself has uh, a more rectangular, boxy version. And the one that controls the cable box is real long. So by their size and shape, and then there's the one for surround sound and a bunch of others. <coughs> Sorry about that. There's going to be more, I'm sure. Faith is the assurance of things that we hope for. We find the information that they are there to hope for, trustworthy, because of the source, because of the one who told us that that was out there ahead of us, forward from where we're currently standing. And the conviction of things not yet seen. That is, we're firm, we're confident, because of who told us. And because of everything else God has done that you and I are not capable of doing without him, if at all. I've fished around for a story. I'm not satisfied with any of the ones that I stumbled on, but here's one I'm going to try, and I need you to bear with me and try to get it. This is an oft-repeated story. It's been in people's lives and cultures for generations. Robert Annan grew up in Dundee, Scotland in the 1840s. He was in his uh, single digits and early teens. He fell in with the wrong crowd. None of our children do that. He fell in with the wrong crowd in his teens while he was learning masonry, the art and practice of masonry, from his father, who was a mason and in the business. So, work time, he was learning a worthy trade. Play time, he was off the rails. By the time he was 14, he had already spent three months in prison. And they were worse than the places we send our teenagers today, which are not great. I know because I've spent hours and hours and hours and hours visiting my large youth group wayward sons who ended up there. By the time he was 14, he'd been in prison for three months already. And after many more mistakes and infractions of wayward behavior, as time unfolded and he began to grow, he began to attend gospel meetings in his early 20s. Now that might seem totally not making sense, except this is Dundee, Scotland in the 1840s, where there was nothing else to do at night. The only action on the street were the kids who gathered to listen to the street preachers. I don't think that would work today, but they were desperate. So that's what they had to do and that's what they did. And while he's doing that, like many of them, he's listening to all these words all these prophecies, all these quotations from Scripture. And he begins to question his future. He begins to question eternity. He begins to question his place in it. Or is there a place in 
eternity for him to have a future. Waking up with one too many hangovers one morning, he came to realize he couldn't reform himself. He did not possess the self-discipline when all his buddies were around, slurping suds, slapping each other on the back, shouting words I can't say in this room without losing my job. So, coming to the very important realization, a mature realization that he can't fix himself, he can't reform himself, he sought God's help. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed that God would help him find confidence and assurance that he was saved in faith by Jesus Christ. And the more he prayed and the more he didn't hear anything, the phone didn't ring, nobody knocked on the door, nobody shook him awake at night, he began to fear he was permanently lost to salvation. That the only reason God wouldn't speak with that voice and the King James English that goes with it, thee and thou and thine and all that, he began to fear he was permanently lost to salvation. And this caused him sleepless nights. His family knew he was going through this. His neighbors who his family talked to knew he was going through this. I guess they're at the clothesline or the well or whatever they were doing. And the word spread to the point where two ministers came together one night to speak to him. And they said, basically and succinctly, Reader's Digest condensed version, Robert, if you heard a voice assuring you of salvation, or felt some strange tingle or warmth or feeling that is not normal, would you then believe and rest on the idea that you are saved, that Christ died for your sins? Is that what it would take? Hearing the voice, feeling the feeling? Is that what it would take? Would you believe then? Well, guess what, Robert? In lieu of actually hearing his voice, which some people do, God gives you his word. It's written in the scriptures. It's preached on the street corners. It's studied in Sunday school. God gives you his word that Jesus Christ wants to be your Lord and Savior and his atoning death on the cross will save you from all your sins and grant you an eternal blessing of happiness and joy by his side in heaven. Can you take God at his word? Remember Jesus said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I will in no way reject. I will in no way decline the gift of salvation because you're worse than the rest or your sincerity is not with enough conviction. Three days later, after those two ministers had been there and given him this challenging question, what does it take for you to have confidence in something that you cannot see and you cannot touch and you cannot hold. Three days later, Robert gave up listening for God's audible voice and simply chose to believe that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior. He made a decision. That's not just for Baptists. It's for everybody. You know Billy Graham's magazine 
the hour of decision? Hello? Am I the only one here who loves Billy Graham? So Robert went on from that day forward to preach regularly on street corners to join his different group of friends. And many of the hearers who heard him talk about this business about faith, about trusting God's word, came to know Jesus personally as he had, and their lives changed. And their behavior turned around. And they laid off a few more prison guards at the detention center. Then in July 1867, relaxing on a raft in the Dundee Harbor, you all know Dundee's part of Scotland, right? The former child super swimmer, which is his, the good thing about him as he was growing up, dove in the water to rescue a youngster in trouble. Successful in saving the boy, he ended up drowning himself. But earlier, that same day, while leaving his house, he had written death on the gate of his sidewalk with chalk and the word eternity on the pavement in front of his house. And this is important because he had just preached the previous Sunday night I may never have another opportunity of speaking to you. I may be in heaven before the next Sabbath. And he was. And he was at peace with his last doubt firmly resolved. So resolved that he was assured of what he hoped for, which was his salvation. And he was convicted that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior, although he never heard his voice. Remember what Jesus said to Doubting Thomas in John 20? Blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. That is the blessing of faith. That is something you can't take any credit for except having the brains and the willingness to trust and the heart to believe that God might love you in spite of everything on your list. You know that list that St. Peter keeps in the big book for when you stand up there at the gate? That list. Yes. Jesus said to Doubting Thomas, blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. We are blessed. What more blessing could there be than living the rest of your life with conviction and assurance in something you can't taste or measure or feel or smell or use any of your other senses nor your wonderful brain to take for proof. The author of the Hebrews encourages us to look forward. And the older I get, the more important I realize that is. Because the older I get, and the more times I have to see the dentist and have surgery, and the more times I have to go to the emergency room at St. Clair's, and the more times, and the more times, and the more times, this falling apart some more. I'm not looking forward to a whole lot unless I make myself. What I find myself slipping into is looking back to the days when I rode my 26-inch two-wheeler up and down Manor Road and Woodcrest Drive and all across town and where I ran in track not that I was a competitor but <laughs> I did enjoy running and played my clarinet and got all kinds of praise from my teacher as she's collecting the bucks from my father 
You know how that works? What a wonderful, wonderful musician Alan is. He ought to be good for another three or four years of my private lessons. Back in the 50s, they were $5 a half hour. That was a lot of money. I don't know where my father got it. We didn't have it for a lot of other things. But I find myself looking back to the good old days when Livingston was woods and not McMansions. And 80 hadn't been built yet the bane of my existence. Did I ever tell you we had a five foot crack in the dining room window at Lake Arrowhead from them blasting through the rocks in Rockaway? Poor Alan. Poor window. I said, when are we gonna fix that, Mom? And Mom says, when they're done blasting. I was out of high school, I was out of college, and I was out of seminary before they stopped blasting. It's a long time. How much time, as you're unhappy with something about you, or the world you live in, or the town you live in, or the health you're living in, do you look back and think about the good old days? when this area was heaven on earth. God wants us to shift our vision from the rear view mirror of life to where we're headed. To a city. Not a dirt crossroads and neither Dover nor Livingston ever was, although it was a stagecoach crossroads. In fact, same, same stagecoach went all the way from West Orange to Hackettstown, right through here. Did you know that? No. He wants us to see this permanent place with stone foundations and carefully crafted cedars of Lebanon beams and all the rest of it that went into city living in those days. That was the ideal, that was the promised land, that was where the swells lived. Or let's move it up to around the Second World War, where the suits lived. The more money you make today, the the less likely you are to wear a suit because you don't have to. You're your own boss. Who's going to tell you you have to wear a suit? When I worked for two guys, I was told that I had to dress, you know, clean khaki pants, button down, collar shirt, tie, name tag, the whole nine yards. And I'd walk in and she'd hand me a, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 what do you call them? The manager of the department would hand me this dusty old rag and say, now you gotta go out there and you gotta move every appliance that's sitting on those shelves and dust it off and dust off the shelf and put it back. And you know, I went home every night, she did that to me. The front of me was a different color than the back of me. Why did I have to get so dressed up if I was gonna be a dust mop? doesn't matter. That's the way it was. You were told what to wear and you wore it. Now, that's not the case. Well, in Paul's letter to the Romans, he writes, for I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in creation,
good, bad, or indifferent, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing. That's an absolute. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing means nothing means nothing. Now, you can go back to adolescence spiritually, you know, and test God and be your worst, but it's not going to change how he feels about you. It may change how your mother feels about you, but it's not going to change how God feels about you. Sin cannot come between us and God. Nothing can, because Jesus took care of all of it once and for all. It doesn't have to be repeated. So I challenge us all to embrace one of God's highest value gifts, if not the highest value gift. He promises to make a room or a mansion just for us. When I was younger, I used to think that meant walls of shelves of Lionel trains and a little music stand in the corner for my clarinet in case Miss Merlu showed up for another lesson. God is building into the future a place where we fit, a place where we connect, a place where we feel good, a place where we are at peace, a place where we are confident that he is there with us. Ain't that great? And all God's children better say, thank you. Alleluia. Oh, no, don't start. <laughs> Just burst out, couldn't help it. Look forward to a city that has foundations and whose architect and builder is God. As those present in our sanctuary prepare to present their offerings here, may you who are present via YouTube or Facebook please consider making an offering of your own, sending it in by mail, so that we can reach out tangibly to the people who continue to come here for help and hope and food and somebody who's glad to see them, frankly. I watch them walk in, many of them are still timid when they say hello. And then they hear Jeanette, or they hear Ed, and you can see them breathe a sigh of relief and begin to smile. That's the real stuff we're here to hand out. But the rest does cost money. So, please consider joining us in the overhead here and making that ministry and others happen. For God pours about blessing upon blessing on us, not so we can hoard them or take pride in what we have, but that we might share our blessings with the same generous spirit with which he shares with us. So with joy then, not obligation or duty, joy, let us bring our tithes and offerings to God. Unite your hearts as I pray. Lord, you look down from heaven, see all humankind, and long to call us home. Please accept these gifts on behalf of your people, that they would increase faith, nurture, hope, and be reckoned as righteous in your sight.
worship you. I worship you. You are, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are, we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. It is our sacred privilege to gather around this table and receive from ritual and from memory this sacrament of God's grace. Fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, this table has been set by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is here that we see the symbols of his sacrifice for the forgiveness of our transgressions and offenses against the Father. It is here that we taste and see how good our Lord's love is. For our Savior invites all who ever loved him to meet him here and renew their vows of commitment to the one who is most committed to us. Pray with me. Holy God, you made us with everything else in creation, yet to be above everything else in creation. Without a doubt, we are yours, and you are ours. You breathed into us the breath of life and set us on our journey of life, that we might grow to really know you, to really love you, and to truly serve you. Even after all you did for us, we didn't do so well for you, nor stay in touch with you. With the frequency and passion you have wanted, we have let you down. For we find ourselves loving things, and people, and sports, and pets more than we love you. Because we stop remembering and we stop celebrating all you have done for us in Christ. 
Yet you never give up on us. You have already redeemed us through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. You persist in your pursuit of us through your Holy Spirit, who draws us back to your table and back to you, much like the prodigal son was drawn back to his father. That father prepared a banquet to welcome his beloved child home, much like you prepared this meal through the blessing of this bread and this cup, which are about to nourish our minds and hearts. So now we ask you to renew us, body and spirit, to live in your light and walk in your ways in the name of Jesus, following his example. Amen. To remember and celebrate God's amazing love, let us reflect on the Passover that he celebrated with his disciples when he took the bread, the symbolic bread, in the course of the meal, gave thanks to God for it, and shared it with his best friends there as he shares it with his best friends here. And his words were to the effect, from now on when you break and eat this bread, think of it as my body which I will give for you. And remember that I have given it for you. And later, in the same manner as the bread, Jesus took the third cup of the ritual, the cup after supper. Again, he gave thanks for it. Again, he shared it with his dearest friends. And this time, his words were to the effect, from now on, whenever you drink from this cup, think of it as my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Because whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you celebrate what I came to do for you and give to you until we are reunited in heaven. The gifts of God for the people of God. Is there anybody who does not have a sanitary, antiseptic, bread and cup, please partake as you are able. The bread's in the bottom. The cup is on top, of course. patient Father in heaven, we thank you for yet another meal, another celebration as it were, which we've shared with the rest of your family of faith. Your grace and mercy, your love and devotion, they know no equal. As you walk with us all our days, we pray you will find us walking with you in all your ways. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Sorry, I was trying to do too many things at once. Okay, I think we might be good. Um, Joys, so nice to see everybody here today on this beautiful morning. It's a little hot, but I'll take this over snow any day. So, um, but it is so nice to see everybody. And we want to pray for all those who struggle, who are struggling and fighting battles we may or may not know about. Please, Lord, be with them and let them know that they're not alone. And our birthdays today, Carol Dorsey, happy birthday, so yay, and Ellie Shan. We believe, so we pray. 
O oh God of every race and nation, language, culture, and creed, we thank you that you seek us indefatigably and rejoice without restraint when we find you or return to you. For as different as we seem to ourselves one from another, it is clear you exercise no difference in your concern for all of us. Whether we break bread together or whether we fight each other, we are clearly all your children. We pray for the bereaved, the still in shock, the infirm, the discouraged, the oppressed, and those who persevere when their difficulties seem greater than their resources. We beseech you to watch over our children and our grandchildren and the future they will inherit. Bless them with wisdom and strength, patience, persistence, and the self-esteem to successfully make their way in the world, as well as a place for them and theirs in it. Come to the aid of all who have been overcome with pandemic viruses, fires, floods, insufficient funds to meet the challenges of rising prices and interest, and grant us the encouragement in our faith, which can only come from fellowship with other believers in your agape love, even as we pray in the way you have taught us to, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our parting hymn, although hopefully nobody's going anywhere, is hymn number 389, O Jesus I Have Promised.
Before we go any further, I want to tell you how happy I am to see Rachel back. <laughs> Good to Safe be and sound. And it kills me to make it public, but I'm happy to see Eric back. I'm still trying to figure out why. Every day we stand with all the faithful who have gone before us and with all the faithful who will come after us. Yes, they're here with us, not yet born, in one great fellowship of witnesses to the empty tomb, to many post-resurrection experiences, to answered prayer, divine guidance, and the miracle of life itself. Therefore, let us encourage one another with the faith that has been given to us let us lean on one another whenever our own faith wavers or falters. And may the voices of praise we've raised today reverberate throughout the halls of heaven this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated for a reflective postlude. I can't see. 